Hello, everybody. How are you? Ha yes, indeed, we're all hot, yes. Um, happy National Dance Day. Welcome to the Kennedy Center. Reach Bluestone stage for this evening's Millennium Stage presentation, brought to you by the Centene Charitable Foundation, with major support provided by Target and the Marriott Foundation. Woo! Tonight's performance is part of the Reach Opening Festival. Wells Fargo is our presenting sponsor of the festival. Please note tonight's, please note professional photography and recording during the performance is prohibited unless otherwise authorized. Millennium Stage celebrates the human spirit by presenting a free performance at 6 p.m. 365 days a year. All of our performances are broadcast live and available on demand at kendi-center.org. And now, please join me in welcoming. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> So uh, your host of the evening is a native Washingtonian. She is a longtime dance writer and critic who has been watching the DC dance community grow and thrive. And she is direct, hold please. You can never hear anything when a plane's passing by. Anyway, she is uh, directing the local DC dance journalism project. For more information on that, check out Dance Metro DC's website. And now, at this time, I would like to welcome your host, Lisa Traeger. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Hello, Washington, D.C. dance lovers and friends. I am just thrilled to be here tonight uh, to share dance at the Reach stage with you um, and share a few of my own hometown's groundbreaking dance artists on National Dance Day. We're going to look at seven artists tonight who have made lasting contributions to our greater metropolitan region and to the dance field through their work as educators, artistic visionaries, dancers, and choreographers. First, I want to acknowledge our most senior DC dance elder, Therrell Smith, who opened a ballet school. Yes, yes. And you'll be clapping again when you hear about Therrell. Thorell Smith opened a ballet school serving the African-American community in the district in 1948. She turns 102 in November. Yes. Wait, there's more. The last time I saw Thorell, she was still practicing yoga and could still get her leg up on the bar. All right. Okay. By the way, who knows when Congress closed down to see a dance performance? Anybody? No? Okay. In 1840, when Austrian ballerina Fanny Elsler toured Washington, Congress adjourned every evening that she danced. It was reported that at a banquet, congressmen drank to her health from her ballet slipper. Today, we drink to yours. We begin our program with the Jones Haywood Dance School, now located, yes, yes. All right, all right. Now located on Georgia Avenue in Northwest DC, the school was founded in 1941 by pioneers Doris Jones and Claire Haywood to provide opportunities for African American children to study classical ballet in the segregated city. Sandra Fortune Green was one of many standout students. Cheetah Rivera and Hinton Battle also studied there. Under the tutelage of Miss Jones and Miss Haywood, in 1973, Fortune Green became the first African American woman to compete in the international ballet competition in Moscow. Yes, yes, legends here. Today, Fortune Green carries on the Jones Haywood legacy as the school's director. Let's welcome the Jones Haywood Conservatory dancers performing alumna Brandy Lee's Gusty Winds and Willows.
Thank you, ladies. Oh, that was spectacular. Oh, thank you so much. Contemporaneous to the founding of Jones Haywood School, native Washingtonian Mary Day established the Washington School of Ballet in 1944 with her mentor, Lisa Gardner, who was trained by ballerina Anna Pavlova. In 1976, Day created a chamber-sized ballet company at the school bringing a young Singapore-born choreographer to the company. Chu Sang-go's crisp, angular style and his inherent musicality became the company's signature aesthetic for many years. Today, the Washington Ballet is directed by hometown dancer Julie Kent, who's somewhere here tonight, um, and grew up in Montgomery County and had an illustrious career at M American Ballet Theater before coming home. Here to dance for you now are Peyton Anderson, Andrea Amen, and Nicholas Cowden in an excerpt from Go's most beloved contemporary work for the Washington Ballet, Fives.
you so much. That was lovely. Thank you. Polish Jewish modern dancer Pola Narenska worked in Germany during the pre World War II years. In 1935, she fled anti Semitism and Nazism to settle in the UK before moving to New York. There in New York, she studied with some of modern dance's mid-century giants, Martha Graham, briefly, Doris Humphrey, Jose Limon, and others. Pola settled in Washington in 1951, later opening her own studio and a small company. After a years-long hiatus, Pola met a young dancer choreographer by the name of Liz Lerman, who inspired Pola to return to the studio. In the 1980s, when Paula was in her 70s, she created In Memory of Those I Loved Who Are No More, known as her Holocaust Tetralogy. Today, Rima Faber, who performed in Paula's dances during the final decade of the choreographer's life, will teach us some of the principles of movement from early modern dance. The weight, gesture, and emotion that were used in dirge part of the tetralogy and are emblematic of German expressionism. The work memorializes the more than 70 family members Narenska lost in the Holocaust. Here's Rima Faber. Pola was an early modern dancer. She studied with Wigmann before she came to the United States. And when modern dance first evolved, it had several major principles that were very different than ballet. And I'm going to let you experience for yourself what the movement is, instead of my just performing part of it, so that you can get a sense in your own bodies to understand why modern dance evolved. So as Lisa said, um, the first principle I want to have you explore, and you can do it from sitting, you can stand up and doing it, is weight. Instead of the lift of ballet, instead of leaving the ground, I'm holding, a, I'm holding a video, which you may purchase at the um, merchandise exchange area. But instead of the, the lift, modern dance developed weight. It developed a sense of gravity. Modern dance was felt. I guess I did too much. Modern, <laughs> set off the, the, the mic. Modern dancers use the ground. So just lift an arm, let it go, and drop it. Do you feel that? That's gravity. Lift the other arm and let it fall on your head. Now you know what gravity feels like. Okay. In movement, if, you, if some of you want to stand up and do this, if you just fall into your leg, it's called a lunge. Just fall. Or you can sit and lift a leg and let it drop. But you won't feel your own weight in that. So that instead of a lovely walk, you're feeling the effect of gravity. Okay, try it. Just try it for yourself. Just drop into your lunge and drop. Oh. Yes. Okay. That's weight. That's using your weight and feeling your weight. And that was an entirely new approach. Another in gesture was tension. Whereas in ballet, you're floating. Early modern dancers used the tension of a gesture. They used the tension of a gesture. So feel 
tighten your muscles and then reach to somebody near you and reach to somebody else and reach up to the heaven and reach down to the earth. Okay. But it wasn't just try a gesture like maybe warding something off or pushing something away or covering your eyes. Yes, and that tension expresses emotion. So when you are gesturing with tension, think of what this might mean. In I mean different things to different people. Think of what this might mean. Think of what this might mean. You are expressing deep emotion. And these are the three, three of the main principles. There are many principles in modern dance. But in early modern dance, these really evolved into a new form. And the reason I'm telling you about this, in Pola's final decade, she choreographed four dances, which became known as the Holocaust Tetralogy which was her personal experience. Now, she wasn't in a camp, but as a Jew, she was exiled, her family died, and the, the, the ghosts of these memories, the ghosts of these feelings never left. And the, these are the kinds of movements that came from German expressionism, that came from Martha Graham, and this is why I wanted you to feel it. So what I would like to do is we'll play the music. Now, what's ironic, and I didn't know this coming up, she used the same music the, the uh, Washington Ballet students did, the same music, but with entirely different sense of it. Now, we're not playing that part of the music, but when the music starts, start just from reaching to different people, maybe reaching someone you do know, maybe reaching someone you don't know. Play with that. Play with weight. Play with what it might do to your shoulders. Play with the emotion that you actually can start to feel in doing the movement. So, music please. say that Pola lives on through her choreography and she lives on through an award that is given annually a lifetime achievement award and an award for outstanding current work and the this year we just awarded Michelle Ava her lifetime achievement award at this reach festival 
We are awarding Alexandra Tomalonis. I don't know if you have read her criticisms and her reviews. She, she puts out a magazine called Dance View that is highly respected. And the award for, um, <laughs> the award for current work is being given to Laura Chandelmeyer tomorrow night at Dance Place. And so Paula lives on and passes on the legacy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rima, for sharing that with us. I really appreciate it. Paula um, was um, a powerful figure in the Washington dance community, and I interviewed her in a number of times. She's very memorable. Liz Lerman arrived in Washington in the 1970s to complete her degree at the University of Maryland. After Liz's mother died, she began teaching dance to senior adults and incorporated them into her choreography with her young company dancers, breaking down barriers and ideas about who can dance. She founded the Dance Exchange in 1976 as a place where everybody and everybody um, can dance and is encouraged and welcome to dance. Liz tackles tough ideas in her choreography from nuclear proliferation to war crimes to the mapping of the human genome. Today, we'll see an excerpt from Lerman's Nocturnes using music by Willie Nelson and performed by Esther Geiger, Kelly Mitchell, and Thomas Dwyer, who was one of the original dancers in the piece. They will be joined by Ralph Glenmore and Viette Tia in a, brief select, in a brief section from the Dance Exchange's newest piece, which is commissioned by the Facility for Rare Isotope Beams at Michigan State University. Choreographer Elizabeth Johnson drew inspiration for the piece from Liz's opus on physics, philosophy, and the creation of the universe that Liz called the matter of origin. Choreographer Elizabeth Johnson Levine's Of Equal Place, Isotopes in Motion, follows nocturnes. So 
Measure how many times I thought everything was going to be all right. Measure the species we have never seen. Measure the weight of this silence starting now. Measure the growing urgency as the name is called again and again and again. Thank you so much, Dance Exchange dancers. I always love seeing you on stage. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Okay. Montgomery County raised Carla Perlo came to dance relatively late, beginning her serious study in college in Cincinnati. Shortly after Carla returned to DC and began teaching dance, she founded what is today our region's most prolific and important dance producer and studio. Dance Place. Yes, let's hear it. Okay. <laughs> Perlow's introspective solo, The Flight of Time, was created in 1992 when she realized she was midway through a life she hopes to live until at least 80. In this work, she looked both back and ahead, examining the brevity of life. After 37 years at the helm of Dance Place, Perlow stepped down in 2017. Dancer, choreographer, and educator, Christopher K. Morgan took over, yes, okay, <laughs> took over as artistic and executive leadership of the organization. Today, Christopher steps into Carla's choreography, performing an excerpt from her Flight of Time. Aloha, y'all. Thanks for greeting me back. As um, I became the director of Dance Place two years ago, it was actually quite intimidating. In many ways, I was not just stepping into Carla's enormous shoes to fill, but also her co-director of about 19 years, Deborah Riley, had also retired at the same time, another important figure in DC dance. And so as I took on that mantle, it was a lot to bear. And as I continue the work of Dance Place, as Lisa just said, Carla made this dance when she was 40, thinking of it as the midpoint of a life that she looked back on and the life she anticipated continuing to live. I think a lot about where we've been and how we connect to it to move into the future.
So, in true Carla fashion, we have to do a little something together before I leave you. When Carla taught me this brief excerpt of this dance, she shared with me all of the details of, which each, uh, of what each gesture meant. And it seemed meaningful and important to share some of that with you. So I'm gonna ask you where you are seated and as you are able to join me in two ideas. The first is the very first physical idea you see in the dance. And if you imagine clasping your arms around something and maybe cradling something really precious, like a child, and rocking it. Look at this beautiful sea of bodies and arms dancing together here at the Reach today. And then the second thing that we're gonna think about, letting that go, is what is it that climbs on top of you and burdens you and gets bigger and bigger and faster and faster? And what Carla advises me any time I'm feeling that burden is to just let it go, Christopher. She says it a lot, actually, when we check in with each other about how Dance Place is doing. And believe me, she checks in with me a lot. So we have two things, this very precious child. Carla has a son who's a grown man now. His name is Dan, and sometimes Dance Place was mistakenly called Dan's Place but it's almost like she gave me this child to take care of. And then there's this accumulation, and I think we can all relate to this, as life moves faster and faster and faster, and things keep accumulating on top, and the best thing we can do is let it go. And the last thing I'm gonna do is at the very end of the excerpt you saw, I did this big, long reach, just like this gorgeous space that we are so blessed to have here in Washington, D.C. Thank you for joining me today at The Reach. Thank you. Oh, beautiful. Thank you for sharing all of that with us, Christopher. I didn't even know some of the secrets of that piece. Few know that Melvin Deal, DC's grandfather of African dance, started out studying ballet at age 17, but he was turned off when one teacher told him that while the only real form of dance was ballet, his chances to make it as a black man back then were slim. Deal immersed himself instead in researching African dance and drumming, forming African heritage dancers and drummers in 1960. He told me, I don't know if you remember this, but way back, maybe it was 20 or 25 years ago, it was one of my first interviews ever, Melvin, you told me that you didn't set out to make star dancers, but, and I'm quoting you here when I tell you what you said, you said, I work to save the lives of the young children from disenfranchised families. I remembered that. Deal has been teaching and mentoring children, teens, and adults in wards seven and eight of the district since 1960. Today, I'm so pleased and honored to welcome African heritage dancers and drummers to the reach. Give the reach an applause. Hey, hey, hey. 
Thank you. Are we on? Okay. African Heritage Dancers and Drummers. It's great to see you here at the Kennedy Center. Yes, yes. Okay. Our region has long had a love affair with tap dance. Yes. Representing this indigenous American art form, we have DC's very own tap lady, Miss Yvonne Edwards. Yes. Woo. Miss Miss Yvonne, who just turned 85, Woo. don't tell anyone, is co-founder of Knock on Wood Tap Studio. Here today are dancers from resident companies Capital Tap and District Tap, founded by Lisa Swinton Eppard. Lisa's a second generation tap teacher and DMV native. Listen and watch, listen and look around and watch for a mashup of historic tap pieces, finishing with the beloved Shim Sham, also known as the Tap Dancers National Anthem. Thank you, Capital Tap, District Tap, Miss Yvonne and Lisa. You might have spied someone extra in the back row. Okay. We conclude our um, celebration of the Reach and National Dance Day 
with another invitation for you to dance with us. Dancer, chore choreographer, Sarah Beth Oppenheim, founder of DC's Heart Stuck Bernie, interviewed staff and volunteers here at the Kennedy Center to help her envision a new dance created in honor of these beautiful new spaces here at the Reach. So please stand up as you are able and get ready to dance. I'll hand it over to Sarah and her crew. Thank you so much to the inimitable Lisa Traeger. A round of applause for Lisa. And thank you to the Kennedy Center for having us here tonight. I want to first acknowledge the Piscatawa land on which we dance this evening by taking our hands and placing them on the ground. And this is what we'll do at the start of the dance in a few minutes. So I start tonight with a quote from President Kennedy. If art is to nourish the roots of our culture, society must set the artist free. And when I interviewed the VP of Artistic Planning, Robert Van Leer, he described the architecture of the reach as a building that dances, moves, humanizes, curves the arts and the artists. The building sets you free. There's also a congressional mandate that the Kennedy Center must present the best of arts and education here. And they do this by presenting the best of national and international dance, but also by presenting the best of local dance, which is what we are celebrating here this hour tonight. And so I'm going to ask you to stand up. I'm going to divide you into two different groups. The group on this side of the walkway, you're going to do what Emily and Kate do. You're going to make a fist pump with a C. And our group over here, Viet and my group, we're going to do some letters. We're going to make a K, and you go C. We're going to do a D, you go C. We're going to do a me and you, C. And it sets us all free. We go K, C, and D, C, and me and you, C. And it sets us all free. All right. Looking good, we got some more to learn. Next up, the illustrious Justice. The Justice Forum is one of the new spaces in the reach, and justice is one of the five ideals attributed to President Kennedy. Magdalena, an architect from Stephen Hall Architects, shared with me that they wanted the building to not only look artistic, but also invoke creativity in you. So the crinkle concrete walls found in the Justice Forum and throughout the reach are all about sound jumping out of the space to envelop you and also welcome your words back into the folds. So we do the illustrious justice. You take your two hands, like the scales of justice, you take four steps walking toward us at the front of the stage. The illustrious justice and back. Illustrious. Justice, one more time, you come forward with your scales and back it up. Awesome, you guys. All right, then we've got the Jerry Lewis Tour de Force. Jerry Lewis is a volunteer who's been working here at the Kennedy Center for over 50 years. She gave her very first tour in a hard hat before the center was done being built. Jerry takes tourists around. She shows them the history, the art, the architecture of the space. But she really wanted to show tourists what was happening with the artists. And so Leonard Slatkin was the conductor of the National Symphony Orchestra at the time. She wrote him a letter and she said, Dear Maestro, would it be possible for me to bring my tourists inside of the theater to hear them rehearse? He wrote her a letter back and he said, As long as we don't know you're there and we don't hear you from the back of the space, you can do this for one year. Fast forward excuse me, forward to 2019. And one of the defining features of the reach is the transparency of the spaces, the ability to witness the creative process directly. So thank you, Jerry Lewis. Your tours became a tour de force for the center. And to do the Jerry Lewis tour de force, she asks you to look over here and she asks you to look over there. She wrote a letter so we can see and hear better. She asks you to look over here and she asks you to look over there she wrote a letter so she can see and hear better thank you Viet. <laughs> all right next up we've got the mickey barra's guest house mickey barra was a longtime vp of production here at the kennedy center and if you ask him he will tell you that the kennedy center was a way of life not just a job 
When asked, Mickey explained that in representing the nation's na uh, premier cultural arts center, it is important to treat every person and every company like a guest in his house. He also wanted you to know that providing a level of professionalism and expertise unsurpassed anywhere in the world also needed to come with a dose of fun. So we're gonna dance in Mickey Barra's guest house. We're gonna take two steps forward and dance in the guest house. And two steps side and dance in the guest house. Two steps back and dance in the guest house. And two steps side and dance in the guest house. Awesome. Then we've got the Peace Corps around and round. One of the spaces in the new campus is called the Peace Corps Gallery. President Kennedy established the Peace Corps by executive mandate in March 1961, and his mission was to encourage mutual understanding between Americans and peoples of other nations and cultures. Today, Alicia Adams, VP of International Programming here, keeps this mission alive by organizing incredible international festivals, where she curates a celebration of music, dance, theater, visual arts, literature, food, fashion, design, and architecture from around the world. Alicia reminds us that we are a nation of immigrants. She reminds us that programming here must reflect our community. And one way she explains that these international festivals are important is because they connect immediately to our local communities. It's sort of like an artistic Peace Corps reimagined for maximum impact right here at home. And so we go round and round, reaching out to other cultures through our art and celebrating our own multifaceted, many cultured art forms right here at home. So you make two peace signs the Peace Corps round and round. You place your hands on your core. You dancers out there, there know the core is the center of your body, but also the heart is the core of our values. And then you make your feet go round and round. We do it faster. The Peace Corps around and round. And the Peace Corps around and round. You got it. You got it. Next up, we have the link. One of the goals of the new space is connection. Connecting artists to audience connecting artist to artist, and it's about collaboration and togetherness in our artistic endeavors. The covered pathway that also lets you look into studios J and F is also called the link. So you need three friends for this one. You're going to take a friend, you're going to link arms, you're going to go around. You're going to find another friend, you're going to link arms, you're going to go around. You're going to find a third friend, you're going to link arms, you're going to go around. And there we've got the link. This one's done. We are off to the three pillar break. I also got to speak with Nicole Weaver, the VP of Strategic Planning here, and she shared the three pillars of the strategic plan of the Kennedy Center. The first is world-class art. The second is world-class education. And the third is that this is a living memorial. And the whole idea is fluidity, that you have to smash those together, that you have to break down the hard borders between genres, and you have to break down the hard borders between audience and performers. So we're going to do that with a three-pillar break. We're going to jump up for world-class art. Jump. We're going to open a book for world-class education. For memorial, clasp your hands together and shake with some really vigorous energy. Great. And then we mash it all together and we break the borders down. Next, we learn the Moonshot Thought. Moonshot Studio in the Reach is a maker space where families and students and community groups come together to create. President Kennedy called for America to think big and travel to the moon. You put your hands on your head, you swish it back and forth, the moon shot, and you make those zigzag thought lines. And you turn to the side, the moon shot, thought to the back, and the moon shot, thought to the side, the moon shot, thought. All right, two more steps we've got to learn. We are here, I know, we're almost done. We are here on the National Day of Dance. Can I get a woo woo? And it is in large part due to a lady named Jane Rabinovitz. She's the manager of dance programming here at Kennedy Center, and it's because of her hard work, her passion for all things dance, and deeply meaningful commitment to the DMV dance scene that you are experiencing the joy of National Dance Day today. Jane reminds us that dance in the DMV is not just one thing. It is many things. It is classical, contemporary, culturally specific, culturally blended, technical, improvisational, abstract, narrative, young, old, proscenium, site specific, theater, music, visual, auditory, contemplative, and celebratory. And Jane is also all of these things. And that's how the artistic minds behind the Kennedy Center invite you to think about the new space here. 
Jane is our point person today, our connecting element, and so we do the Jane, Jive, and Reach, my personal favorite. You're gonna take your hands, you're gonna go head to tail, Jane. Head to toe. You're gonna go across the DMV, across the DMV. Jane does the Jive. And then she does the Reach, reach out to us. We go Jane head to toe, and Jane across the DMV, the Jane Jive and the reach one more time the jane head to toe jane across the dmv the jane jive and the reach and then we come to the last step of the dance today the kick can can rally this dance is called the kcr so a kick heartstruck bernie loves a good kick nice and expressive it's also about kicking down the borders and making way for new experimental artists here at the reach we also have the can-can. This isn't the French can-can, though I could make a nod to all the international things that happen at the Kennedy Center. This is the can-can in the spirit of celebrating the can-do, elicited by JFK's call to action, and also by the nature of open, fluid space in the reach. So we do the can-can, boundary-breaking and artistic fusion, can-can. And to bring it all together, we've got the rally. The history, the arts, the communities that are gathered here today, it's about rallying ourselves, rallying our nation of immigrants, rallying the artists in us set free, and rallying all the dancers out today. Oh, that brings us to the end of the lesson. Michael, we're ready for the music. Here we go, everybody. The kick can can rally. We acknowledge the Piscatawa land. The illustrious to the front. Back it up. The Jerry Lewis Tour de Force. She asked you to look at this. She asked you to look at that. She wrote a letter so you can see and hear better. We go to Mickey Vera's guest house. To the side. Mickey Vera's guest house. Down to the house. To the back.
All right, everybody, thank you for joining us for Millennium Stage tonight. Um, but the party's not over. At 8 o'clock, we have Fail of the Musical happening on the Greach main stage. Um, if you want to hang out until then, there's going to be dance music happening. We just ask if you're going over there, please bring your blue boxes with you. Thank you so much. <laughs>